Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. A community is on high alert after finding elevated levels of lead in some of its drinking water. We are going to do everything to keep the children safe. We'll explain why it's costing the local school district hundreds of dollars each day. It's more than halfway into the fiscal year and in Illinois, the governor and the legislature have yet to agree on a budget. Illinois public colleges and universities are laying off staff and draining their reserves in an effort to stay afloat. The teachers seem scared. It's like if you're, like your professors seemed like they were worried then like it made the student, like it makes the students feel worried too. As students transfer out, what impact will it have in Indiana? Plus, an orangutan at the Indianapolis Zoo is due to give birth sometime in the next few weeks. We'll show you the ultrasound pictures and explain more about the endangered species. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The water crisis in Flint, Michigan has people across the country wondering if their water is safe to drink. It's a question that's especially on the minds of residents in Greentown, north of Indianapolis, where recent tests showed elevated levels of lead in some of the water. That's where reporter Barbara Brozier is. Barbara, just how high are the lead levels? Joe, the levels are just slightly above the EPA's maximum allowable limit for lead in the water. The superintendent says he has fielded calls from some concerned parents. Most of the people we spoke to, though, they didn't want to go on camera, but told us they don't know enough about the problem to be concerned or the levels simply aren't high enough for them to be seriously concerned about their safety. Still, the school corporation and the county say they're going to proceed with an abundance of caution. Dozens of containers of bottled water are stacked in the middle of the main office at Eastern Howard High School. Our children are probably more hydrated than they've ever been. It's been this way since results came back in January that revealed elevated levels of lead in some of the school corporation's water. The EPA's lead action level is 15 parts per billion or higher. Tests revealed levels at 20 parts per billion in a high school classroom and 22 parts per billion at a kindergarten water fountain. That uh, raised some concerns, although it's not a Flint, Michigan situation. In Flint, uh, they had levels as high as 13,000 per billion in some cases, but still it was elevated. So the school corporation shut off its water fountains and for a couple of days even forbid students from washing their hands in the school sinks. Until levels dip back down below the allowable limit, the corporation is spending $400 a day to provide bottled water for drinking and cooking. We're going to keep spending the money until we get the all clear from the health department that we can start um, transitioning back to the Greentown water utility. The schools teamed up with the county health department last week to offer free lead testing for students and staff. They tested over 600 people. We do expect some levels to be elevated, but we really think the level elevation will be from the home environment perhaps from a lead-based paint source, which is really our greatest problem with lead. But levels of lead aren't just running high in the school's water. The Indiana Department of Environmental Management found elevated levels of lead in November while doing routine testing on some Greentown homes and businesses. The town is already taking steps to correct the issue, asking IDEM for an emergency construction permit to install a polyphosphate injection system. They started using it earlier this month. What happens with the water when it goes through the pipes? Just because of aging of the pipes, it may contain lead, the plumbing components and so on. The lead, just because of normal corrosion, may leak out into the water. 
when they add phosphate to the water, it helps to stabilize and stop that corrosive process and the leaching of the lead. The County Health Department is offering free testing for Greentown water customers who live in homes built before 1986. That's when new laws about lead-based plumbing were enacted, and they've already had about 25 people come in for test kits. I think it's important for um, folks to be able to determine uh, what their their lead level is for for their own comfort. It could take some time for the town's new polyphosphate injection system to bring lead levels back down. Even so, the health department says Greentown water is safe to drink. The local school corporation just isn't taking any chances. We're right now in the process of putting filtration systems on all of those drinking fountains, and that's going to take a couple of weeks. And then once those filtration systems are in place. We'll retest the water and see where we're at and determine if then we can allow kids to drink from drinking fountains. It could take up to four weeks before those lead tests come back. After that happens, the county says they'll work with the school district and the local utility company to determine how to move forward. Reporting in Greentown, I'm Barbara Brozier for Indiana News Desk. Thanks, Barbara. We're joined now by Jim Barnes. Barnes is a professor with IU School of Public and Environmental Affairs and the Maurer School of Law. He was also there for the formation of the EPA and has the EPA's general counsel. Thanks for being nice, here. Nice to be with you. Today, you know, we just heard in that story about this, the superintendent of the Howard County School Corporation said that the lead levels there are not close to what was found in Flint, Michigan, but they did exceed levels. Can, can you put in perspective the two sure. different situations? Uh, well, sure. To, to begin with, the e EPA's goal for lead in drinking water is zero. Any, any level of lead in drinking water is something we want to avoid. And it, EPA does have what's called an action level, which where we suggest people test the schools and, ho and uh, drinking water in schools and homes. When it exceeds that, then they need to take steps to try to figure out what, what how's that lead getting into the drinking water, usually because it's leaching out of... Of, of plumbing fixtures, but as you, you mentioned, it's a long ways away from uh, from Flint, but still I, I would really commend the superintendent for taking steps here because we're most concerned about uh, lead exposure to young children whose brains and so on are still developing, and that's not the point when you want to have them mm -hmm. uh, exposed to excessive levels of, of lead. I wanted to bring up the House Bill 1082. Can you tell us a little bit about what that bill does, and if it was enacted earlier, okay. could that have prevented what's happening in okay. Howard? Well, in its original form, it would have prohibited the state regulators from en enacting any regulations that were more strict than EPA has. And as an example, it would fit this. During the time I was deputy administrator at EPA, we made a decision to extend the drinking water standards to schools and factories that drew their water from wells as opposed to getting it from a public water supply, municipal supplier. If, if we were still in that state of affairs and, and this issue came up uh, with this school system and they, they were drawing their water from wells, the state of Indiana could not tell the, uh, or the, the item could not tell the school system that they needed to uh, do something about uh, uh, the lead levels in this, the drinking water in the school. Hmm. Now, the, I, my understanding is that the state is in the process of amending that mm -hmm. and that it may be uh, le less onerous, but it's a provision that's in place in, in a number of other states and hard for me to understand why yeah. a state would not want to be protective of its citizens. Thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it. Now for headlines, we go over to Sarah Whitmire, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. An appeals court will review a challenge from Indiana and 17 other states over the EPA's expanded definition of waters of the U.S. in the Clean Water Act. The broad definition includes personal property, meaning farmers will have to get expensive permits to dig fertilizer runoff ditches on their own land. I think we can expect to see a 4-4 split in the Supreme Court, which certainly raises the stakes for how the uh, Court of Appeals will decide the case, because if the Supreme Court is split 4-4, then a Court of Appeals decision will stand. Given the amount of time it'll take to go through the Court of Appeals, it is unlikely that this case will make it to the Supreme Court before Justice Scalia is replaced. 
An appeals court is considering whether the University of Notre Dame security police should be subject to the state's public records law. ESPN filed a lawsuit against Notre Dame last year after the university refused to hand over police records. A St. Joseph County judge ruled the private university's police department shouldn't be subject to public records requests earlier this year. ESPN's attorney appealed that decision and oral arguments in the case were heard this week. A decision is expected in the coming weeks. The ACLU of Indiana is planning to appeal a Marion County judge's decision to dismiss a lawsuit involving the Department of Child Services. The DCS worker involved in the lawsuit says she once held cases for 43 children. Indiana state law says that a DCS worker should not have more than 17 cases at a time. The judge dismissed the lawsuit Monday, saying the case workers don't have the legal right to bring a claim to the court. And Walgreens is making the anti-overdose medication naloxone available without a prescription. The pharmacy provides customers with instructions for using the drug when they purchase it. Naloxone is available at Walgreens in both nasal and injection forms. It's part of the pharmacy's plan to increase access to the drug throughout the country. Other pharmacies in Indiana stock the drug, but customers have to have a prescription. Two Indiana universities are vaccinating students, faculty, and staff against the mumps. Butler is requiring faculty and staff to get the vaccine and strongly encouraging students to. IU is holding a mumps vaccination clinic, but it's not requiring it for anyone living or working on campus. There have been nine cases of mumps at Butler, five at IU Bloomington, and one confirmed case at IUPUI. The FBI is now investigating the attack of a foreign exchange student last week in Brown County. Police say Dana Erickson attacked an exchange student from China with a hatchet in Nashville. He told police he was trying to bring about an ethnic cleansing and did not think it was a crime for him to strike evil. Erickson pleaded not guilty on charges of attempted murder, aggravated battery and battery. He has a half million dollar bond and has a competency hearing in April. The student suffered serious injuries but is expected to recover. Kokomo's Mayor Greg Goodnight wants to create a non-discrimination protection for the city's LGBT community. During his State of the City address this week, Goodnight said he was disappointed that the General Assembly failed to pass statewide protections this session. Everything indicates that they're not going to bring it up again. So uh, you know, we're going to uh, do with the, what's been done in many other cities, you know, places like Zionsville and Anderson and Indianapolis, South Bend, Carmel. Um, we're going to have to do something here locally. Good night says he will encourage the city council to amend Kokomo's human rights ordinance to add protections for sexual orientation and gender identity. After over a month of testing, Indiana Animal Health officials are allowing normal operations and movements of poultry into Boyce County. About 400,000 birds were affected in the area by an outbreak of the avian flu. Farms in the area have not been able to distribute poultry or poultry products since mid-January unless they tested negative for avian flu. Quarantines remain in effect on nine farms that were depopulated and are still working on cleaning and disinfecting their facilities. The YMCA in Kokomo is closed this week as workers prepare to open a new facility. J.D. Gray takes us on a tour. The $16 million facility is located across the street from the old YMCA's location. It took about a year and a half of planning and construction to build the new gymnasium. Uh, among the many improvements, the building features high-tech workout machines, an eight-lane pool, and a snack bar. It also features a modern design and lots of natural light. Although the community-focused nonprofit is moving into a new building, the staff values the role the organization plays in Kokomo's past. Uh, and even though I'm not a Kokomo native, I love history of my why, my whys that I've served at over my many years. And I love the fact that that's been with us for 100 years. I love the fact that we're pulling up 106-year-old wood from our current wise gym floor and installing it on some desks so it'll always be part of us again. The YMCA says that even though the facility is ready to open, they are still working to secure several million dollars to fully fund the building. For Indiana News Desk, I'm J.D. Gray. And Joe, the YMCA will reopen Monday after a ribbon cutting wow, ceremony. Wow, it looks great. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk.
We go to Illinois, where the budget impasse means colleges haven't received a dime of state money. They're cutting programs and laying off staff to stay afloat. And students are looking at schools outside of the state to transfer. A rare pregnancy is creating extra precautions at the Indianapolis Zoo. We'll meet Siri, the expecting orangutan. Those stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Nature takes you places where you've never gone before. It's watching something that's actually happened. Nature sure draw me in the story. Just their power and their grace. You know, it was just so beautiful to watch them. The, the movement and just watching the body and watching the chase. Like this huge, lush, vibrant watercolor. Gems. <laughs> there was such a shot of underneath watching these elephants swim in this deep water. I had no idea even they could swim like that. I saw the one monkey pulling on this one monkey's tail. And the monkey like, man, what you doing? What you doing? It's like the theater of the wild or something. Seven billion trillion animals living on one planet. It's like more colorful than life, than you think life can possibly be. Somewhere between the mystique and the beauty of it is reason enough to, to sit down and watch. That's life, and that's nature. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Illinois public colleges are in trouble, and it could have an impact on higher education in Indiana. It's more than halfway into the fiscal year, and Illinois Republican governor and Democratic-controlled legislature are still deadlocked over the state budget. The impasse means the state's 12 public universities and 48 community colleges haven't received a penny of state funding going on nine months now. It's a nerve-wracking time for students. They're on the line for tuition because the state isn't paying out money for grants and scholarships. And they can't help but ask, is it worth it? As Sarah Whitmire reports, given the uncertain future, some students are choosing to transfer. Eastern Illinois freshmen Caitlin Reposh and Jenny Cisneros find themselves in a difficult position. They love their school. They're at home walking through campus, but in some ways feel like they're standing by and watching it die by a thousand cuts. We don't want it to close down. So they just need to like really just like open their eyes and realize like we're not just here because we just want to like go to college away from home. We actually want to be here. But that decision isn't totally Cisneros to make. Eastern Illinois is struggling. Lawmakers' failure to pass a state budget this year means public universities have gotten no money. At EIU, that amounts to $40 million for operations and another $7 million plus for grants for low-income students. Universities are dipping into their reserves and emergency funds to stay afloat. But as the impasse heads into its ninth month, the cuts are getting deeper and more noticeable. Even last night, my friend was saying how, she, in like her math class, like they would always provide like graph paper, but the teacher's like, oh no, like we don't have the money for the graph paper, like we don't have the money for this because like all of the budget cuts and everything. Eastern laid off nearly 200 employees and is requiring others to take furlough days. I know all <laughs> of my teachers have like talked about it in every single one of my classes, and they were just wondering what like our input was on the entire situation, and they like the teachers seem scared, so like if. Yeah, like your professors seemed like they were worried then like it made the student like it makes the students feel worried too. The friends can't help but feel anxious. Um, I mean right now we're just like I'm being trying to be like optimistic about it but if it comes down to it where it's just like well there's not like really any hope then yeah I'm gonna need to definitely look at new schools. Eastern's president declined our request for an interview but in an effort to ease concerns and also to dispel rumors he pinned a letter to students this week saying he expects the state appropriation to come through soon and he reiterated that the university is not closing. The message was just as much for parents as it was for students. Um, my mom was worried about me transferring she wanted me to come to like ISU or something and I was like no I don't want to do that. That's LaShawn Harvin, a junior at EIU. He just wants to be able to take the classes he needs to finish. And then my teachers told me that the credits, credits wouldn't transfer over as well, so that would be a loss, you know, in my, on my, like, side. I mean, if you're a student at a school like that, how confident are you going to be to continue there? So there's a natural tendency for some students to think about transferring elsewhere. 
John Beacon is in charge of enrollment at Indiana State University. He says there are a lot of places Illinois students can look if they want to transfer. Wisconsin, Iowa, and Purdue already draw a lot of Illinois students. But in some ways, ISU is uniquely positioned. The campus is only about 40 miles from EIU, and the towns are quite similar. Certainly the local students who go to Eastern Illinois University from those counties probably chose Eastern because of its location. Because we're fairly close to them, I would anticipate that if there are students that are looking to transfer from Eastern, the likelihood is they'll look at us because we're very similar in many ways. Indiana has seen a gradual increase this year in the number of students enrolling from Illinois, but the State Commission for Higher Education says it's too early to say whether that's connected to Illinois' budget impasse. The situation in Illinois isn't expected to get much better soon. Some politicos are speculating the governor and the legislature won't come to terms until after the state's primary election in March. Others think the political infighting will continue and there won't be a budget this year. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. Lawmakers' failure to agree on a budget has a ripple effect. If students keep transferring, there will even be less money flowing into schools in the form of tuition. And as Eastern's president wrote, without the state supporting public universities, the cost in tuition would become unaffordable for most Illinois citizens who would then leave Illinois to seek their higher education. Well, the legislative session is winding down and bills are moving quickly around the state house. Let's take a look at what's changed this week. The Senate is holding firm in its opposition to House Republicans road funding plan. House Republicans have proposed increasing gas and cigarette taxes to create long term road funding. But the Senate and Governor Mike Pence are staunchly opposed to those tax, to, to those tax hikes. The Senate is arguing for a short term fix and then the creation of a task force to consider funding options and make recommendations for next year's budget. The task force would have explicit instructions to exhaust all current funding options before looking at tax increases. Few education bills to talk about. Legislation to rescore the 2015 I-STEP test is no longer on the table. The bill covering the provision died this week. Yesterday, the Senate killed a bill that would have allowed schools to bypass negotiations with teachers' unions when hiring certain educators. Two other education bills are moving forward. A bill aimed at improving teacher quality through professional development passed through the Senate. The other bill covers teacher pension plans and hiring practices. One bill aimed at curbing meth production remains at the State House. The House has chosen the bill that places the least amount of responsibility on the pharmacist. The bill allows the patient of record to continue purchasing pseudoephedrine from their pharmacist or pharmacy technician, but new customers would be facing limitations in the amount they can purchase. A bill opening records from Indiana's closed adoption period now awaits the governor's signature. Last year's bill was killed because of concern over mother's privacy, but in its new form, the bill gives mothers options about what information can be released. A once controversial bill covering police body cameras is headed to the Senate floor after garnering amendments and support. Initially, concerns grew out of burden of proof provisions, but amendments allow that police should release body camera footage unless they can prove why the video should not be released. You may remember a bill that prevented women from having abortions based on disability, gender or race. That bill died in the House, but it has since been resurrected in the form of an amendment in a Senate committee. It's now headed to the Senate floor. Lawmakers continue to tweak a bill regulating high fenced deer hunting. The recommendations include a minimum fence height of eight feet and a minimum site size of 80 acres. The bill also includes a ban on the use of drones in the hunting. A bill that unanimously passed through committee this week will reduce BMV user fees for 2 million Hoosiers and create a more simplified fee system. The bill is headed to the Senate floor.
The decision about whether cosmetologists should be allowed to shave their customers' mustaches and beards will be left up to a state agency. A Senate committee decided Thursday to defer the issue to the Indiana Board of Cosmetology and Barber exam Examiners. And a bill regulating online fantasy sports is going in front of the House after receiving amendments in committee. The bill includes regulations that prohibit insider information and includes annual fees for the fantasy sports companies. Orangutan births in the United States are rare and that makes the expecting great ape at the Indianapolis Zoo that much more special. As Becca Costello reports, zoo staff are preparing for the birth with great interest. Caretakers are closely monitoring Siri, a Sumatran orangutan at the Indianapolis Zoo. They're taking regular ultrasounds to make sure both mom and baby are healthy. Sumatran orangutans are critically endangered. There are less than 7,000 left in the wild and only about 200 in captivity in the United States. That makes Siri's pregnancy very important for conservation efforts. With all the good stuff happening with the baby, we want to remember that we need to also have good things happen for orangutan conservation in the wild. The biggest threat to both Sumatran and Bornean orangutans is loss of habitat. That means Siri's baby can't be introduced into the wild. We would be adding to the problem if we kept sending orangutans back because you'd have to go through a lengthy reintroduction process and there's simply not enough habitat. So Siri's infant will bring awareness to the plight of the orangutan from inside the Indianapolis Zoo. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Becca Costello. And that's all the time we have. More news at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members.